there and having a lot of fun and then to spend some time in London as well. It's a beautiful city. Beautiful yeah, city. It's been yeah. a while since I've been there now. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> now I all know each other a little bit. That's great. I say we can get started now. What do you think? Good to go? Yeah. Okay. So all right. Yeah. Go for it. Okay, thank you all and welcome to event Grupa Event 2021. Uh, this is a two days event and it's free for everyone. And especially would like to learn something new on data side. This is for them. And this is for community and by community. So I'm here, your moderate, and I'm Alpha Budpati. Uh, today, today's session uh, is delivered by Edward Pollock and he will be delivering uh, predictive application problems with our database metrics, which is very exciting topic. And I'm really looking forward to that. Edward is a very uh, senior database administrator at Dato INC, and he would like to speak in a, and deliver the session. And he has delivered a lot of session in different events, school Saturday, Saturday data Saturday, and other events as well. He write a books as well. So yeah, please welcome him. If you have any question, then please write down into chat or you can join that Slack as well, which I have provided link to. <clears throat> so with that, I would like to hand over to Edward. Edward, stage is yours. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. This is a great event. Um, I've seen it before and it's great to be a part of it. It's great to present here. Feel free to ask questions during, after the event. I'll have my info as well. I will share slides, SQL, everything. So feel free to take it and use it, copy it, you know, make whatever you will of it. Uh, let's get jumping right in. First off, code of conduct here. There's a link. You can go to it and view the whole thing. The, the TLDR is just, this is a free event. Behave, please. You know how this stuff works. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sponsors are very important. I've run SQL Saturday Albany before. I've been a part of running other events. Sponsors make the event happen. So please thank our sponsors, patronize them, see what they have, help them out. Uh, without them, events just don't happen. So thank you very much to our sponsors, Redgate, SolarWinds, SSG, and Minionware. Thank you very much. So here today, let's talk about something kind of cool. This is a topic that marries together many different areas of the world of data <clears throat> into one. <clears throat> which I think is a lot of fun. So we're gonna talk about database metrics and things that we often take for granted in our, the data we collect over time and how to use that to formulate analytics. So this is basically a traveling from data from applications and OLTP all the way through to monitoring, alerting and troubleshooting and operational stuff, all the way out to analytics and, and further into the data science world if you wanna go that far with this. So it's a kind of cool data journey. It's one that I enjoy and hopefully you do too. This is me. Uh, it's a very rainy day today, so you get to see the umbrella, <clears throat> the old SQL Saturday umbrellas I gave out. I love those things. Um, but this is something I enjoy doing. Uh, I enjoy working with data. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I've spoken at many events. I've written a few books. I have an upcoming book on column store indexes early next year. Uh, I just enjoy this stuff a lot. It's really the simple way to put it. In my free time, I love all the nerdy video games. I like traveling. I've been to the UK before, as Alpa mentioned before. We you know, I, I find joy in seeing other cities and cultures and trying all their exceptionally spicy foods and so on and so forth. I, I live in Albany, New York, uh, upstate, kind of chilly, but lots of farms nearby. So it's cool. So that's me. Feel free to contact me with questions or if there's anything you're interested in chatting about with regards to this presentation or anything of them, Ryan, just let me know suggestions, thoughts, feedback, go for it. <clears throat> all right, so to keep this simple, what is the database metric? What are we even talking about? Why are we here today? What's this discussion all about? And ultimately, a database metric is really any data or metadata that describes your data, the servers it resides on, and how it behaves. We're really looking at the shape of the health of your data, not just what's in it. <clears throat> so this is many things. This is very often the data we use for troubleshooting and alerting and monitoring, those sorts of things. But very often with that data, we measure it. If a problem happens, you get emailed or texted or some app bugs you, and then the data is thrown away and gone forever. What we're going to do today is talk about how to take this data and keep it, and then trend it and do cool things with it. <clears throat> and we can find a lot. And that's the goal of this. Ultimately, the goal is to find app bugs. How can we use data about our data to understand how our application performs and find when it's not performing correctly? Or, when something may have gone wrong in a release, 
For example, let's say you put a brand new table out that's never been used before and data begins pouring into this brand new table, but somebody forgot to put retention on it. Oops, there was supposed to be 90 day retention of the data, it was supposed to be in the code and it was forgotten. And you won't know at first if something went wrong. You'll just know that this table is growing and growing and growing, <clears throat> but never shrinking. <clears throat> And that is something that you should be alerted to. There's a brand new table, it's growing very quickly and it's never shrinking. That may not be normal. We should know about that. And it's unlikely that any kind of alerting would tell you something is wrong until your drives fill up or something bad happens. Inserting to the table gets too slow because there's a billion rows of garbage in there. Those are the sorts of things you don't want to happen. Now that's the last resort. That means you kind of failed. You built your code, you deployed it, everything ran fine and then it broke. We want to avoid that. So we want to predict problems while there's still time. We want to find out there's a problem before there's a problem. And even a disk alert is too late. Something telling us, hey, we're down to 10% free. That's nice. That's an alert. But it's not really good enough because now you probably have a table of 10 billion rows of garbage you got to clean out at some point and then rewrite your code last minute and deploy a bunch of changes and deal with it, which has its own host of problems because now you're rushing. We want to deal with that kind of, we want to find these things early. Earlier is better. <clears throat> we could find bad data. Bad data can lead to all kinds of unusual behavior. It can result in tables being written to more or less than usual. It can result in things being slower or faster than usual. It can result in no, many ways things can go wrong that can be trended and understood that are the result of bad data or maybe bad metadata. Maybe some configuration is wrong somewhere and we don't know it, but it's resulting in unusual behavior. We can find performance problems if things are slow, if they're not performing correctly, if more resources are being used than are expected to be used. We care about that. If the amount of resources being used are increasing faster than normal for a certain time of day or a certain point in time, we want to know about that. What's our latency like? And is growth normal or not normal? Data always kind of grows. Data usually doesn't shrink. That's the nature of what we do. And so if it's going to grow and grow and grow over time. How do we know if it's growing normally? or not so normally. And we can discover that pretty easily by just trending that data and looking at it. And the ultimate goal of this whole presentation is that now is better than later. We wanna solve a problem now rather than discover it later. Finding it early means you can relax, solve it at your own leisure, take your time and deploy a fix and you feel good about it. And the people you work with probably also feel good too. If it happens later, no one feels good. You're rushing, you get woken up at two in the morning and that's always the theme of a lot of bad things as you get woken up at some weird hour or somebody gets woken up in some ways it's worse if it's somebody else now your your code mistake <clears throat> or you're missing some problem results in somebody else getting woken up at some weird hour and so we we don't want to be responsible i don't want to be the person making that mistake and neither do you or anybody else a simple first example for what kind of data we can take and trend and look at and use is row counts this is a simple metric. It's very easy to measure. There's multiple ways to measure it. And it ultimately measures depth of data. How many rows do you have? It doesn't tell you anything about how large your data is. It doesn't really necessarily tell you how many gigabytes it is or terabytes or petabytes or whatever, or how many columns you have. But it tells you how fast your data is growing in terms of row count. It's a very easy thing to measure. And it's a very easy thing to trend over time because the numbers are pretty absolute. There's no tricks here. They're just numbers. And then we can take that data over time once we have weeks and months and maybe even years of it and look at it and say, we know that each table grows at a certain rate. We can very easily write our own code or prox or use Python or R or something else to analyze this data and discover when is statistically the data growing more than it should. And for many applications, you can probably write your own code, write in a proc and just be done. It's not necessarily complicated. It certainly isn't rocket science uh, in any respect. So data run, data grows, it grows too fast, you catch it. And by catching it, you can then identify not only is this normal or not, but if it's not normal, what caused it? Did a release just go out? And then three days later, we saw data growing very quickly. Well, is that expected or not expected? Do we forget retention? Is there a bug in the app that got released? Is some process out of control and behaving in ways that shouldn't be behaving? We can find that quickly because we're keeping an eye on the data. And very often alerting would only catch this problem when things begin filling up or getting too big. We don't want it to get to that point. And you can compare all your tables across a whole organization. If you have one giant database, you can look at all the tables in that database and say, how does each table grow? And how does it grow over time? And how can we use that information? Or if you're multi-tenanted and have the same database schema in multiple places, 
you can compare the same tables in different databases or in different places to see are they all growing the same way? Or is one growing faster than the rest? Which, p and which detail here matters? And that detail in the database is important. If you measure how big a database is, it'll tell you something. If you know how big each table is, that tells you a lot because a table isn't just something. It's not just some technical construct. A table represents an entity. You're storing accounts in a table or sales orders or contacts or people. And so when they grow or shrink, you're measuring those changes of that entity. Hey, we're adding 3% a day in new sales. Well, what does that mean? It went to 6%. Does that mean there's a problem in the app? Oh, maybe it means we're selling more stuff. That's great. We should then prepare for the future knowing we're selling more stuff. We're going to use more hardware. That's information that's very useful. But the, the trending over time is the key to all of this. This is data that we might look at once in a while when we need it, but we want to save it forever and trend it. And it's not big. Row counts aren't big. You may have a lot of tables, but ultimately it's just the name of an object, schema, table, database, whatever, and then how many rows are in it? Done. Not a lot of data, it's not very complicated, it's very easy to compress and store. I like demos, demos live are fun. I love when they break, it's very exciting. So let's dive right in. <clears throat> I created a table here already called row count historical. This is a simple table, all it is is an ID. If you want it, you can use it, you don't have to, with a date, a database, schema, table, row count, that's it. And I just used a date here because I figured I would capture it once a day. For my purposes here in this demo, once a day is good, and therefore a date is fine. If you want to capture it more often, twice a day, four times a day, once an hour, it's customizable. You can choose to make it a date time to zero or something like that, or three, and go to whatever level of uh, detail you want. I compressed it with page compression here. If you expect that you're going to collect a lot of data, in the order of millions, tens of millions of rows, consider a column store index in the table and just insert that data in order over time and it'll do great. But I'm keeping that here and ditch the identity too if you do a column store index, it's probably not a good idea. But otherwise, uh, I'm using page here because I don't expect my local machine to generate billions of rows of data anytime soon, but your situation may be different. I then create a store procedure. The store procedure goes in, grabs any data that would have loaded from today already so we don't get dupes. And I have dynamic SQL. The dynamic SQL iterates through all the data, well, iterates in quotes. It generates SQL that will execute against every database on this server, and it uses DMDB partition stats to get row counts. Then it joins some other objects to get the metadata, like what's the object name, the schema, just get the user tables, and so on and so forth. But, and I limit it to the clustered indexes or the heaps because we don't care about the non clusters we don't want that. This view is really the best way to get row counts in SQL Server. Uh, it's not necessarily 100% accurate. It's possible that it could be off by a tiny amount as metadata is updating, but it's extremely fast and it won't lock your data. If you go to this view and grab data out of it, you'll get it very quickly. If you do select count stars from your tables, it might be kind of slow and you may lock your data or you may cause memory pressure, or loading pages into memory and hurting your PLE and so on and so forth. So I recommend don't do count stars from tables use a view to get your row counts. It runs it across all the databases. I excluded some system table uh, databases that we don't really care about, I didn't care about. You can include them if you want though. There's no real downside. Probably want to exclude tempdb, but otherwise you can goof around with the rest if you want. And I execute it. So this is only about, what, 30 lines of SQL here. This is not complicated. I'm going to go ahead and run it. I probably have like 10 databases in my local machine at most, nothing fancy. But it would run pretty fast regardless. I use very similar code to this in production environments. It runs very fast. Then I can go to this table and see what do I have here. I've run this before. So you can see that I've run this before in the past. And I have some results here from August and September during past demos. And here it is, really simple. Date, database, schema, table, row count. There we go. And the beauty here is now we collect it over time. If you were running a process in an environment you care about in production, you'd run this every single day. You would see a row per table per database every single day. I would see it in the 25th, the 24th, the 23rd, the 22nd, and so on going back. And that history is very valuable because you can now write a validation process on top of this. This isn't big data. You can run a validation process on top of this that will take today's data and compare it to recent data or trends. Uh, you can add additional tables and metrics to this if you want to calculate things like percent change over the past day, seven days, 30 days. What's my trend line look out over time? 
or you can do all that math on the fly if you want. Stats is really up to you. I'm not here to tell you how to be a statistician. I'm here to show you what data. we can store and the kinds of things we can do with it. <clears throat> but ultimately, you can ask, ask those questions. What has my growth been like on average over time? And does my current growth violate that expectation? If I was growing, let's say, in a table like this one here, this table has 231,412 rows. Let's say it grows at 1,000 rows a day. And I suddenly see out of nowhere, it's growing by 30,000 rows a day. And it's getting higher. That should trigger an alert somewhere, not an alert, as in it's going to wake you up overnight, but it should trigger some kind of thing coming to me, an email, something, a message that tells me, hey, I found some strange data growth here. Go look into it. And I would look into it because the growth has gone up by 30 times and find out is this normal or not normal. And if it's normal, great. Then this average will change over time and account for the new growth, and that'll be normal. If it's not normal, I can go in and save the day and feel like a really good person and do some good work. I put notes here on purpose so I don't forget or anybody forgets, but of course this can get big. This is getting every database on a server. It's getting row counts for every table every day. And while you can throw a column or index on it and store it pretty efficiently, you may not want all the data. So only collect the data for the, the databases you need. You could add parameters to the stored procedure to filter the databases if you want to only get certain ones perhaps. Maybe put a list that comes in uh, or a, a user-defined table that tells, uh, I just want these three databases. That's all I care about, the rest don't matter. And you can filter it down. Or maybe there are a lot of tables you don't care about or you know exactly which tables you care about. You can filter down by table too. This is really customizable. It's meant to be used and played with and goofed with, made to satisfy what you need, not necessarily what I need or what this demo needs. You can also consider removing tables that are smaller than a certain amount. Because realistically, if a table has six rows in it, you may care very deeply about those six rows. I want to always know the six rows in this table everywhere. If it's not six rows in some important metadata table, something's broken, that's bad. But you may not care. You may think, hey, you know what? Every table that doesn't have at least 1,000 rows, I don't care about. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. You could omit them if you want. Or if many of the tables are small and don't provide a lot of value, you can omit them. Not a big deal. You can also make a slowly changing dimension table if you want to say, I will only insert a row into here when it changes. If my table has a thousand rows in it every day for a month, why create a new row? It's convenient, but if I'm dealing with data size issues, I don't have to. I can just put a new row in there whenever it changes and have a start and end date. And now I have a history table. So many ways to filter. And ultimately, you're looking for strange changes. Do things increase by more than you expect or less than you expect? Was there no change when you expected change or more than less over a period of time. This really is a chance to look for anomalies and play. And so very often when you begin creating these kinds of analytics, you'll keep it simple. You'll do a few really simple, easy, straightforward, hey, get my trend and then see if I violate the trend by more than 20% or something or 10% or whatever. And that's great. But over time, you can get more complex. For any metrics like this, you can go further. You can say, hey, we can run some machine learning on this to learn how our data grows over time if you're so inclined. You can get fancy, you can get complicated, you can really learn a lot about your data and how it grows. And ultimately, this is not just information that makes database administrators and other data professionals happy. This can make your developers happy uh, because the developers now can learn about how their data grows. This is the application right here. Your data is your application. It is what powers it. It's where everything is stored. Knowing how that data grows is very important. And last but not least, a very important key about row counts is that row counts tell you about how data grows and shrinks. Therefore, it's really measuring inserts and deletes. It doesn't tell you about updates. If you have an issue that involves lots of updates going on, like the database has no inserts and deletes, but it has 10 trillion updates going on every day, something might be wrong. This won't get that. This is different. All right, let's jump back and talk more about other things. Here's a second example. Those are row counts. Row counts tell you how much your data is growing in terms of numbers of rows, data depth. A second useful metric that can be helpful beyond the world of alerting and monitoring is database IO. This is something we can measure that tells us how much activity is there versus each database file, data, logs, secondary data. And this is really useful information because it tells you how many writes are occurring in your database and how many reads are occurring in your database. And this is valuable data. This tells you really an idea of how is your storage and your memory being hazed 
and how is your application doing that hazing? This is really useful. This allows you to not only talk about how much change there is over the course of a day or a week or a month, but you can find out certain times of day when things are busier. Is that busyness normal? Are the number of reads and writes unusually high or low over time? This is very similar discussion to the row counts. Are things unusually high or low? And this can be also used to understand growth over time. At the end, of, ultimately, your storage has a limited ability to read and write, physical writes, physical reads. You can only do so much of that over time. Any storage device, whether you have it in a data center somewhere or off in AWS somewhere, has, uh, has limited capacity, IOPS. And is somebody telling me here that I'm talking really fast and I don't need coffee this morning? You're kidding me. You're kidding me. Um, do you have a question or anything, Alpa, by the way? I see your hands up there. Yes? No? OK, we'll keep going. Since I don't need coffee, it's all good. Database IO tells us about the activity against the database. And that's really useful. Again, trending over time is the key here. You can monitor off this data and try to understand times where your IO is so high that it may be breaking and causing trouble for environments. But really, the trending over time is the value. And like with row counts, we can demo this. And I intentionally tried to make these queries as simple as possible. Uh, the dynamic SQL may be a smidge and ugly. That's, that's cool. And I do agree with you, by the way, coffee is life. I love coffee. I drink a pot every day. So just start laughing. Have fun. Here we go. Same exact idea as before. I create a table. This table has in it IO virtual file stats, historicals. So this is going to be the exact same deal as the row counts, but a little bit of a bigger table because I have more things to measure. Were there actually questions back there? Um, I didn't see questions. So. We take the table, we have an ID, we have a sample time. And this time I used a date time too because I want to put time in here as an element because I may care about this more than once a day, perhaps once an hour. So I'm going to do once an hour here. Why not? Database, file name, file type, physical name. So a little bit of information about the file and what it is and how it works. And then simply number of reads, bytes read, writes, bytes written, done. <clears throat> and then again, I, can, I compress it with page compression. Like before, if you think this is going to get very large, this should be smaller than row count data. It's a row per database file per unit time. So therefore, it can get maybe big. But if you think it's going to get big, millions, billions, rows, whatever, column store index it, call it a day. If you have any questions about column store indexes, I've written some articles on it. I'm writing a book on it. We can talk about column store indexes later. They're a very useful thing to have for very large analytic tables. Just like before, here's a stored procedure. This stores procedure will collect our IO virtual file stats for us. And we have a date here. I put a date here. You can use a date time. It's really up to you how you do it. And then I insert data into it. And ultimately, this is coming from DMIO virtual file stats, which is a dynamic management function. I pass in nulls in this case because I want everything. And I'm joining sys master files to get a bit of information about the files and sys databases to get a little bit of information about the databases they reside in. I run the proc. I get some results. I look at my data. Uh, I'll hold off in one second because I see a hand going up. Hi. I can't hear you. I hope you can hear me, or this is a very blame session. <laughs> I'm going to jump in and say Tim has posted a question in the QA. Uh, what are the benefits of using custom tables as opposed to using system tables? Good question. Um, we can't hear you, Alpa. Technical fun is like that. Um, the benefit of using custom tables is that you can fully customize it and put whatever you want into it. You can add any details you want and make things the exact data types you want. For example, date versus date time versus date time two seven or whatnot, uh, you get to customize. So I'd really say that if you want to customize it and build it the way you want to build it, you feel like you may change it in the future and add, remove, add metrics, because you could add metrics into these tables uh, alongside the data. For example, percent change from yesterday or things like that. But if you think you got to do everything according to the books, you're not going to change it at all. Feel free to use pre-existing views or tables to grab the data and don't build your own. I build my own here because it isn't that complicated and I like customizing, goofing around and, and breaking stuff. That's just me. Customizing and breaking stuff. I mean, customizing, not breaking stuff, naturally. Here's our IO virtual file stats data. As, as advertised, we have sample time, database, file name, file type, 
There's where it physically resides. In this case, my C drive, huzzah. But we can see all the files though. We have NDFs, we have LDFs, we have MDFs. And we can see over unit time information. Now this is not unit time yet though. When you sample this data from DMIO virtual file stats, it is a accumulative number since your last restart. So this computer has been on for a surprisingly long time. We all have our Minecraft servers to run, right? So it's been running for a long time. And these bytes read and written are since the last time I restarted, who knows when the heck that was. So this doesn't really tell me how many have occurred per unit time. It tells me how many have occurred since my restart. That isn't very useful. So to get more value out of this, you really need to diff two points in time. So collect this every day and diff day over day. Collect hour over hour and diff hour over hour. And again, this isn't very complicated math. These are just numbers or subtracting numbers. So I'm going to run a simple example here. And I'm intentionally going and writing a little ugly SQL to go back to the last time I ran this. So the last time I ran this was a couple weeks ago. I'm going to diff compared to that. So ignore my ugly where clause here. If you're writing this on a regular basis every day, you can compare, compare today to yesterday, and you're all good. That's ideal. And you'll note I have some case statements here. Why do I have ugly case statements in my SQL? The answer is that when your server restarts, you'll go back to zero. So I'm going to have my bytes read go up and up and up and up and up forever. And then at some point, my server is going to restart for maintenance or whatever, or maybe the Minecraft server is going to restart. It'll go down to zero, and then it'll start going back up again. That's great, but that also means that when I restart my server, my number goes from being 440 million down to zero. So what I have to do is check really quickly and say, is my current number of reads greater than my last run? If so, subtract, get my difference. That's how many reads have occurred since my last run of this job. Otherwise, if it's less than, I know that I've started restarted my server, I'll just grab the number of reads and get on with life. I've seen a few other people out there try to code around the restart times. I find that complicated. I prefer simple arithmetic when possible, but you can code however you wish to code. It is your world of SQL to do so. So we'll run this and get a diff. So here is the difference since last time I ran it. I can see here's my current time. And since the last time I ran this, here are the number of reads. Here's the number of bytes read since last run, reads since last run, writes since last run, number of bytes written since last run. So now I have that all important diff. If I run this every hour, every single day, I now know every single hour how many IOs there are going on on each database file. And that's important. The data file and the log file both provide valuable information about change over time. And if you see any of this growth occur that spikes, something interesting is going on. It might be something expected, like maintenance, or maybe it's bad, like a release just went out and something's going haywire, and we're writing 20 times the data we usually write. This isn't sustainable. So again, the goal of this is trending over time. And again, it may not find the actual specific cause of a problem, but it will narrow it down to a file, which means now you know which database it is. And if you have NDFs, if you have secondary data files, you now know in detail, well, do certain things write to certain data files, other things don't. And if so, I've narrowed it down further. So this is an additional data point. We have row counts from earlier, and now we have IO. IO may not measure something like row counts and the size of your data, but it will tell you change over time. So whereas the row counts couldn't tell you about updates, they gave you an idea of inserts and deletes, IO can tell you about updates. You could have your row counts and your tables never change, but if somebody hits the update button a gajillion times every day, that will cause heavy writes to your files, and you may want to know that. So that's database IO. And I personally think it's a very valuable stat to have. It's a great way to understand how your database is being read and written. And it gives you a little bit of insight uh, in between the world of your application and the physical world of your hardware that you're torturing, which we always do. Next example. This is, again, an even more operational example. This is one that's further into the realm of operational DBAs and monitoring and alerting and that sort of thing. And that's blocking and weights. This is a very simple thing to measure. It's something we care about. If we have too many weights, people are going to complain about latency. If we have serious blocking or weights or locking, that kind of thing, we know we may have a code issue or a SQL issue or, or something's wrong somewhere we got to fix. It's usually a, a, the cause of code, not people, not, not hardware and so on. This is something we can measure and we can trend over time to find contention. Contention is valuable to know. Yes? Thought I heard somebody. I don't? Okay, I'll keep going. 
Contention is important to understand because it tells you when one process is bashing another process into the ground and making it perform worse than it could. We can find things that are slow. And you can also find who does it because the weight stats give you a lot of granular detail, probably more than you need, but I like granular detail. Details are useful. And therefore, knowing who did it and what server it originated from allows us to really connect the dots, understand the source of a problem, and then fix it because our goal is to fix these things, right? We find the problem, we fix the problem, we feel better. And the, rate, the weight resources tell us even more detail about what is the resource. Is the problem memory? Is it disk? Is it weights? Is it locking? Is it parallelism issues? What's the issue? And weight resources will tell you what that issue is. And the goal here is to take this beyond the road of monitoring and alerting, because that is useful. I do want to know if I have weights that exceed some amount of time in a production server. If something's been waiting for 60 minutes, I should know about that. That's very bad. But that's a troubleshooting problem. That's where somebody jumps into a production server and does stuff and kills spids and does things. And that's great. That's very useful. We want to get ahead of that, though. We can measure this over time. We can trend this. We can look at the quantity of weights over time, the quantity of weights per application or per source server, and group it and look at it and understand how much do we have over time per source. And you can crunch it however is valuable to your application. It'll be different for any app. If an app runs just one login, then you won't care by login. You'll care by more granular detail. And of course, demos are fun. I'll jump into one more demo here about weights. <clears throat> this is a lot of data. I wrote a very long query here, a very, very long query. So get ready for it. <clears throat> Ultimately, what I'm hitting here is DM exec requests and sessions to get information about the sessions in SQL Server, the things they're running. I'm grabbing the SQL text for fun because having a little more granular detail is useful. And I'm grabbing the database. <clears throat> all these queries will be available later. I'll put this on Twitter. And if GroupBy is, is putting all the files and aggregating them somewhere, I'll be sure to get them over as well so they have them. <clears throat> and so I, I just filter here by is user process because we don't want system stuff. At least I didn't. You might. Lots and lots of gobbledygook here. There's no reason to really talk about it. Ultimately, I'm just really taking the SQL text and playing with it to make it clean and easier to read. That's all I'm doing here. And we'll run this and see what's going on. On my local machine, not much is going on right now, and that's fine. But one row is good enough to see what valuable information is here. I have my server and my time and my SPID. It's a good start. But I know the database it came from and the wait time. So the wait time is something I can filter on. I can say, don't give me anything that has a wait time under a certain amount if I want. Or I can get everything. And it's very much up to me. I know if it's a blocking session, I can find the blocking chain and figure out who's blocking what. That's very useful. If there's weights, I'll know the wait type. Wait type tells me what's the cause of the wait. I know the host. The host is here on my local machine. Huzzah. We know the app. I'm running Management Studio. Great. Hopefully that doesn't happen in production too often that somebody is causing weights using Management Studio. We know who I am. There's my login and what I was doing. And the SQL text gives us some cool detail. I have the truncated beginning here. It's just kind of a useful, hey, here's what's kind of going on here. And then more detail. And even a query hash, if you want to group by query hash, and a checksum to validate if you want. This is really useful stuff. This tells me so much valuable information. And a really great thing to do with it is throw it into a table. And I didn't put the table here to throw it into because no one is going to do this the same way. This is something that's going to be aggregated and collected differently for everybody. There's no one, one shoe fits all for this one. There's so much detail here. And the detail is the key. You can get 100 different types of data out of this and trend it and group it. You can group it by login. You can group it by hosting. You can group it by program name. If your program names are valuable and there's five different apps that hit your database, do it by program name and group it and find out over time some the important metrics here, some the wait times, how much wait time is there. You can find out how much per wait resource, how much per database. You can find out what the top five or 10 are per day and then if certain ones rise or lower in the stack quickly, you can report on that. So the goal is to really filter all the flack out here. This is a metric where it's easy to get a lot of noise. It's very easy to get things popping up that aren't really problems. Like, oh yeah, a report ran earlier. It's supposed to be a little slow. It had a wait time of 5,000 milliseconds or something. That's normal. Okay. So a little filtering is needed here, but the data is very valuable because then I can go back later and trend this over time. And the trending is the key and say, what's happening over time? You can't really trend a session ID or a blocking session ID over time, but you can trend if something's a blocker over time. 
and how many how much wait time was associated with a session with sessions that you blocked. So if I have a specific thing that runs every day and it's blocking a lot of people, I can find out how much that blocking is quantified by, and then maybe a list of those. What are the top five blocking things in my application per day? How much do they block by? Is that good or bad? Is it increased or decreased over time by a lot? So the value here really is taking this over time and understanding what is going on in my server and how is it changing over time? And when is that change becoming odd? anomalous, strange, not standard, use whatever word you want. I have to be a thesaurus if you want, it's all good. But that's the goal here. Take this and trend it and play with it. And this isn't the only the beginning though. This is just a start. Those were three examples of metrics and I provided demos and some queries to play around with there. Blocking and weights is a very customizable one. There is an immense amount of information and ultimately that's telling you about activity on your server. So the three metrics we've trended so far tell us row counts. How is our data shrinking and growing? IO, how much activity is occurring against our database files? How busy is our app hitting our database? And blocking and weights, telling us database activity over time. What kind of activity is there and how are different processes interacting with each other and affecting their behavior? There are many more metrics. Here's a fun one that I personally love that not enough people use. That's transaction log backup size. If you run a database in full recovery mode and therefore you have transaction log backups, those backup sizes have meaning. Those backup log, those transaction log sizes tell you how much change has occurred over unit time in your database. For example, if I took a backup now of my database, a transaction log backup, and then in one hour, I took another transaction log backup the size of that backup is indicative of the amount of change that occurred in the database. And that's fully log changed. If you have minimally logged, bulk and sturdy kinds of stuff, it won't have the same impact on the transaction log, but that's fine. I'm not really interested in that anyway. What I'm interested in is, is bad change, the unusual change. So if I see over the course of an hour, I've generated a gig of log, I know that that's meaningful. If an hour later I check and I see a gig of log, that's great. And if I keep seeing consistent backup sizes that follow a trend, that trend is useful. I know it's normal. We've defined normal and normal is great, but what if that changes dramatically unexpectedly, not due to a release, not due to maintenance, but due to something else that we don't know. Out of nowhere, one day at 9 a.m., it was a terabyte of change. Well, a terabyte is not good. We can't do that forever. A terabyte transaction log, if you keep doing that every log file, it's gonna break something, right? It means something a lot changed. What changed? And that tells us about writes, not reads. How many updates, inserts, deletes occurred to cause whatever the heck that was that happened, or maybe index maintenance or something else that touches tables and writes to the log. This is a little harder to track. Um, it's easy to track the data, it's harder to investigate. The data is easy, simply measure your transaction log backup sizes. You can get them from SQL Server using a variety of functions, or you can get them from disk, reading all your disk files, it's really up to you, whatever is easiest for you. PowerShell is probably a good way to go or some OS level tool to go out and grab file sizes. File sizes are small, they're easy to store. Not a big challenge there in terms of what we've done so far. It's just kind of like row counts, but these are file sizes. <clears throat> and then you could dig in further though. If you do find problems and you can't figure out what the problem is based on all the metrics you have so far, you see your, your log sizes are too large or maybe too small. Hey, not enough changes occurring. What's going on in our database today? You can dig in and there are tools like FNDB log and third party tools as well out there that will allow you to actually read your transaction log files and look at them and see what's inside of them. Are there problems in there? Is the same insert occurring over and over 10 billion times? Is the same update occurring over and over? Is some table being written way more than it should? What's going on? So we can dig in further if we want <clears throat> and also compare database size to log size. This is a great reality check. If your database is a terabyte and your log size is 10 terabytes, that's strange. That tells me either you have a lot of change in your database or something is wrong. Or maybe you're not running transaction log backups and that's bad. If you never run them, your transaction log files or something else you can measure too. You can measure the size of your database files. We have our IO file stats from earlier. You can also measure the size of your files, which is a useful metric. How big are your MDF and LDF files? and knowing how big they are is then useful for comparison. <clears throat> if I never have run backups before, transaction log backups, I'm in a full recovery mode, we're gonna run out of space eventually. That's very bad. You wanna run those transaction log backups or go to simple recovery or something else, whatever you want. 
But that reality check is useful though. Under normal conditions, if your transaction log files are way bigger than your database files, that means something bad is going on. That means that you have more change maybe than you expect. And maybe that's normal, um, but maybe it's not. Again, this is a define reality and then determine when things deviate from reality. I see a message in the chat here, a Q&A about what's your preference for display of metrics? Um, that is a fun question. And personally, I'm partial to Power BI for visualization. I like the tool. It integrates very nicely with SQL Server. It does a very good job of reading from tables quickly, generating the structures, the relationships, and visualizing data. It's not the only one. I know many people that like Tableau as well or that use SSRS for very simple visualizations for emailing quick things out to people. It's ultimately your choice. I'm a Power BI fan personally, so there's my personal preference. If you're in the Microsoft world, it makes sense. If you're not in the Microsoft world, it may or may not make sense as much. Uh, many of the discussions we're having today are uh, relevant really to any database platform, but this is a SQL Server. Cool. Back to more metrics, because there's many more metrics we can talk about. Transaction log backup size is a fun one because you learn about the change in your database over time and you understand what's happened. You can trend it over time. Hourly, daily is probably good enough. Realistically, you could just measure that every time you run a backup and say, hey, how big are the files? Run a backup. And then next time you run a backup, measure the size of your files, run a backup, done. Another metric that nobody measures that I personally think is useful is if you use SQL Server Agent or some other um, job running process that executes jobs against your server, measure how long those jobs take and trend that over time. That's important because you have jobs that do many kinds of things. They'll perform maintenance. They will run reports. They will defrag your indexes or whatever, or collect data or do ETL. I do lots of different kinds of things. They run, they do things, and there's an amount of time it took to do that task. And you can very quickly establish within a matter of weeks what normal is for a job to run. And there may be some fluctuation on certain days of the week. Jobs take longer or less longer because of changes. Like if you're maintenance, uh, you have a lot of change in one thing, maybe your maintenance takes longer. That's fine. But measure them though, because if job run times get longer and longer and longer, you do care, especially if they get unusually large or if they increase quickly. There's really two scenarios there. One is your job is just taking too long. Like, hey, my reporting job used to take an hour. An hour is great. Now it takes 23 and a half hours. I see a problem coming there. When my job goes over 24 hours a day, it will never finish. So obviously, if a job gets really close to a very, very long runtime, you're in trouble because if it butts up against the next runtime, you're in trouble. A daily job can't take more than 24 hours. An hourly job can't take more than an hour, and so on and so forth. So keeping track of that is very useful. You can also track the increase over time. Job run times should not increase dramatically over time on average, whatever that trend line is, 7, 14 days, however you want to analyze it. If it begins going from you know, minutes to hours, you want to know. This is something very few people look at, but trend this over time and look at it, there'll be a problem. Guaranteed, if a job that was taking an hour goes to taking 10 hours, or a job, a job that one minute went to taking an hour, something unusual is happening, and it's worth investigating. Even if that unusual ends up being a normal thing that's not bad, you'll still be happy you investigated and looked into it because some percentage of the time it won't be normal and you'll be glad you looked. So job run times are a cool thing to look at. You can also look for missed jobs or um, long running jobs. Many ways to analyze this data that not a lot of people do. So job run times are great to track, missed jobs are great to track because when they miss them, you wanna know is that okay or not. Missing things may or may not be good. More things, how about connections? Uh, counting connections is useful. How many connections have occurred to your SQL server over time? There is a limited number you have, most likely. You don't want to use them up, and you want to know how many are being used and who's using them. Is there an app connecting more times than you expect? That could be indicative of a problem. Maybe it's doing the same thing multiple times and shouldn't be. Maybe it's opening connections for no reason. Similarly, execution history <clears throat> is also useful. Understanding the execution of jobs or procs. So we talked about job run times before. You can also keep the history as well. When did the job succeed? When did it fail? How long did it take? And trend that over time to understand uh, what's normal or not normal. Similar would be execution of stored procedures or other entities. You can have your jobs put all that information into tables. So you know not only how long does a job take, but how long do the steps or the procs in between take and keep track of that and find out is there anything taking longer than it should? If it's taking longer than it should, do you care? 
And so the do you care part is really important because sometimes you'll say no, but then sometimes you'll say yes and you'll be glad you checked. And kind of the last here is an open-ended, you can customize and make your own app metrics. Almost any mature app will have many, many ways to measure how it works. For example, if you're a app that processes sales orders, you're like an Amazon or something, you're a store, you'll care about all the orders that are processed. And you may care about analytics based on that, such as average time from order completion, average time to process an order, uh, things like that. <clears throat> how long is it to process the payments? Oh, how much resources it take to do those things? You can measure those application metrics. and save them. And they just become more data points in this puzzle here. So you have metrics that are more concrete, measuring finite things in SQL Server or on your servers or in wherever you keep your data. Or you can make up your own app metrics and put them alongside that. And there's a lot of flexibility here. And the flexibility really means it's up to you to decide what's important to you. I've seen you know, applications that deal in file transfers measure 50 different things about how files are transferred from point A to point B. And you might think, wow, that's boring. I don't care that many things about how files are transferred, but to the people running an application that manages file transfers, they care very deeply about the files and how long to transfer and what color is the file. I don't know. They care about a lot of things. Maybe not the color. I'm just joking there. Cool. There are a lot of ways we can take this data now and go further. What do we do with it? So if you have one big server and that's all you have, you can collect your data right then and there and analyze it and you're good. You may have more than one server though. You may have 10 or 100 or 1,000 or many, many more database servers or instances out there around the world in the cloud, wherever. And therefore you have to decide, how do I analyze all this data? How do I collect it? How do I analyze it? How do I move it? <clears throat> and a good tactic usually is to not go out and grab it from everywhere and bring it back. The, better tactic would be to collect that data locally in each server, put it into kind of a local database, keep it there temporarily, retention it like a week or two maybe at the most, maybe less, and then have a central place come out and grab from those servers that crunch data <clears throat> and bring the crunch data back. That way you're not doing complicated math over servers, over link servers, over the network, and you can very quickly just grab back the data you need and put it into a central place. And once in your central place, you can then compress the heck out of it, column store index it, throw it into your preferred analytic app, put it wherever you want to put it, track your changes over time. <clears throat> and then ultimately you really want to analyze, you want to automate this. And that's really important. You want to automate whatever you're doing here. You don't want to be walking in every morning, sitting down and doing all this by hand. Doing things manually is not only error prone, but it will wear at your sanity. You'll eventually go crazy and that's the end of your life. So don't go crazy. We don't want to go crazy. Therefore, the best way to do all this kind of data is to automate. So whatever it is you're doing, running jobs, running PowerShell, running scheduled tasks, running whatevers, whatever those whatevers are, automate them. <clears throat> and then have those automated processes do all of the trend finding and the anomaly detection. And then they can let you know when there's a problem or something of interest to you. So you're going to modify this code. It won't be static. Whatever you write is going to probably change. You're probably going to find that your anomaly detection is too sensitive or not sensitive enough. Maybe it missed something you want to add in. You're going to modify and add something new in to look for or remove something that was a good idea but silly. And you'll customize over time. But ultimately, the automation is important. Don't do this by hand. Maybe in the beginning, you'll do it by hand to test and play around. But your goal should be to automate. So you sit back, you relax, <clears throat> and your servers do all the work for you. That's living the dream, right? Or so you want to think. And then the last piece is once you have your data, and you have it in a great place, and you've automated the analytics to find anomalies and bad stuff, you can visualize it too. There's no reason to not look at the data. You or infrastructure folks or app developer folks or others may have a vested interest <clears throat> in what does my data look like and how can I analyze it and view it and play with it and goof with it and maybe try to apply machine learning to it. If I'm not really 100% sure what the problems are, what else can I do to goof with my data and learn more about it? There's no downside to these things. The worst case is you fail. 
in which case you try something else. The best case is you've made your life and that of your organization a lot better. <clears throat> are there any tools in the market that you would recommend that does these things out of the box? There are many monitoring apps out there um, that will do things like this. <clears throat> Redgate is a SQL monitor tool. They're one of the sponsors today. So I'll you know, throw them out there as one. Uh, Minionware, one of the sponsors as well, also has some backup automation and analysis. So there are many tools out there that will do this. Those are a couple. I'm picking on the sponsors here because they're the sponsors of the event. Therefore, I'll raise up a bit because they made this happen. There are many other tools as well. If you haven't used any before, feel free to check out some of the free trials online, look into them. There are many companies that have this. <clears throat> I tend to like starting off building my own in the beginning and seeing what it is I need or don't need, and then kind of trial afterwards when I kind of know what I need and don't need. Otherwise, if you don't know what you want and you try to trial software, it may be kind of confusing because they're going to throw a million features at you and you're not sure what you want. You can go that way if you want, just be aware that it's a confusing process to navigate until you have an idea of what it is you're looking for. So definitely, if you want to use third-party tools to analyze your data, to crunch it, to look into it, definitely take a little bit of time first to think about what it is you need to do. What do you want to do? What are you looking at? What are your goals? Goals are always good. And target those and, and then go out and do the free trials and play around and find the software you love. And the benefit, of course, of third-party software is you don't have to write it all yourself and maintain it, which is a very complicated environment. Might be a good thing. Again, it's up to you, though. That's definitely an organizational choice, uh, not my choice. It's your choice. It's actually all of our choice. All right. There are lots more we can do, though. I've kind of hinted at some of the ways we can predict application problems using this data. Uh, a biggie of that, really the biggest one, is what happens release over release? Whether you release once a week, once a month, once a quarter, you're releasing changes in software whether that software is code, whether it's database code, whether it is web code, <clears throat> you're releasing changes and that change may impact the database. So by taking all these metrics that you've collected so far, everything from how big is our data, how fast is it changing, what does it look like, what kind of weights are there, and so on and so forth, we can then track the changes. And when we know there's planned events, we can then correlate them. We have a schedule of here's all the software and hardware maintenance going on. Here are the upgrades going on. Here's releases going on. We can take all that and combine it with this data to say, hey, I just noticed that our reads in this database file went up by 200% yesterday. What's the cause? Hey, wait a second. We released a new version of our software yesterday right before that happened. Hmm. Go talk to development and they'll say something either like, whoops, that wasn't supposed to happen. We'll investigate it immediately. Or, oh, yeah, we imagined some new features. We're writing a lot more data than before. It's perfectly normal. We know about it. One of those two things will happen or maybe something else. Um, somebody will buy somebody pizza in the end, though. And Pizza is always good, right? So no downside to that. <clears throat> we can identify trends over time, and those trends may be simple, or they could be crazy. And the crazy trends are the interesting ones, those are the ones we care about the most, because not everything is simple here. Not everything's going to be a nice linear chart that goes up like this and then spikes. That's easy, and that will happen, and we'll enjoy simple solutions to problems and a great pat in your back for a problem and a job well done. But some trends are complicated. Perhaps you work in a business where the utilization of your database changes hourly or on certain days of the week. Maybe that you know, retail company, for example, will have certain days of the year that have very, very heavy business, like Black Friday, or they'll have you know, the day before Thanksgiving, or they'll have very slow days, like Christmas Day, or for example, or New Year's Day. Everyone's asleep on New Year's Day, right? No one's off buying stuff. <clears throat> that information is useful because you don't want your app to throw off all kinds of crazy alerts saying the data is crazy, the data is crazy. They may already know that. So the more long-term unusual trends of times of day, times of year, types of activity, even narrowing it down by app and so on may tell us more information about this trend isn't simple. It's a little more complicated, but we can quantify it, measure it, understand it. And once we know it, we can then compare it over time and see when things violate that trend and let us know. Can track details, those app specific metrics we talked about earlier, those are whatever you can dream up. I can't tell you what they are, only you and you know with your app and your database because it's unique to you. The best thing we can do here with all of this data is to put it together. Many of these things will correlate. <clears throat> For example, you may wake up one day and look at this analytic data and say, hey, that's strange. I noticed the row count in this table has been increasing by 30% a day over the past four days. That's not normal. Hey, wait a second. The rights against this database are about 50% higher than normal uh, every single day. But wait, wait, wait. They're only higher from 9 to 11 a.m. That's strange. 
Let's look at a little further. Hey, wait a second. I see some like process here that's loading data into the database that runs right at that time of day and it's causing tons of waits. And that's strange. And you go down this path where you say, I have many metrics and they relate. And I can, when I have enough of them, I can correlate events in real life to these metrics and use those metrics to correlate and find those events in real life. Because one puzzle piece may not be enough. If you went to somebody and said, hey, this table grew by 10% a day over the past four days, I'm really worried. They may just say so. But if you came to them with three or four things and said, hey, I have a laundry list here of things that are just not quite right. Can you please look into these? You'll have a little more ammo and a little more ideas to work with here that'll help you piece together the puzzle and figure out what the problem is. Or Maybe it's not a problem, but either way, piece it together. So the most powerful piece of this whole presentation is taking all these metrics that we can possibly measure, things that are traditionally operational, turn them into analytics, and then keep them together in one place so we can analyze them together. So to kind of wrap up before we take a little bit of Q&A at the end, <clears throat> these metrics, when collected and trended over time, make our lives easier. I've personally used this in many forms in production environments and have just saved many horrible things from happening. I have found tables that were growing too fast that had to be dealt with immediately. I found app bugs that would have resulted in huge problems if they hadn't been caught sooner. Just the things you can catch with this are huge and they go from being these outage inducing bugs to a minor inconvenience that you fix, but ultimately you're better off that way. You learn from these mistakes as opposed to panicking. They can aid in capacity planning. If you need to understand how your servers grow over time and how you can budget resources and compute, this helps in that because now you're measuring them over time. We're not just looking for a high CPU at a certain point in the day and alerting that somebody that CPU is high, we're trending it over time. Now you can put CPU usage next to memory usage, next to job run times, next to IO file stats, next to row counts, next to weights. And now I have this big long list and I can plan for the future. The combination of all these is huge. You'll find it easier to find a problem and get your way to a solution when you have lots of metrics because more often than not, you'll see multiple show red flags. It won't just be one. More than one thing happens at one time. <clears throat> if your transaction log files are crazy huge, that isn't the only thing you're gonna find. There's gonna be more out there and that will lead you to those other things that will help you measure and quantify the problem and get to a solution. And as a bonus to a lot of this, you may be collecting a lot of this data already. Your operational folk may already be grabbing this data and using it for alerting already. They may, be, may only keep it for a little bit of time, if keeping it at all, but they're monitoring it and looking at it. And if they're already doing that, this is one more step for you to say, you can monitor and alert, but then can you just send the data over here into this table and I'll keep it here? And now you're kind of mending your, melding your processes together. So you're not doing two siloed things separately. You're kind of combining things here. You don't have to, but there can be a benefit to combining your processes and not doing the same thing twice downside of doing the same thing twice is you may measure it differently in two places. If I measure my IOPS over here with a kilo in front and a giga over here in front, you may accidentally make a mistake eventually when you see different numbers. Whoops. And ultimate goal of all of this is find problems before they come problems. This is the holy grail to all analytics in the regards of this kinds of data is you wanna find a problem before it's a problem. You wanna find something growing too quickly before it breaks something before your application is slow, before some compute somewhere blows up, you wanna know first. If you find out first and say, hey, I have two weeks before this becomes a problem, I can relax and solve this problem at 10 a.m. with a nice big cup of coffee and relax. Instead of 2 a.m. on a Sunday when everyone's panicking and things are on fire and there's smoke everywhere. That's the goal of all of this is solve problems before they start. Cool. <clears throat> now. I'm going to open up the questions. If anybody has any questions about metrics, I mean, I'd love to hear about any questions you have or also any stories or suggestions of metrics you use that are very useful. I love hearing pretty much any ideas anybody here would have. So go. This is my contact info. You can find me on Twitter. Feel free to look me up, message me, talk to me, follow me. Those are all good things to do if you'd like. Are there any questions today? Or are we gonna hang out and chat for a bit? Cause I'm cool hanging out and chatting for a bit too. Did anyone say chat? <laughs> chat, yes, we can chat. If there's no questions or if you think of questions in a few minutes, feel free so to Brian post Brian says, them. thanks, Edward. <clears throat> You're welcome. 
That was easy. I best best Q and A ever. Thanks. I love it. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, I can hang out and chat for a bit. I don't mind. If you think of any questions, feel free to post them. If you're looking for any code samples, I'll post this all as soon as I get off the call. If you have additional ideas, you want to run your thoughts and metrics by me, feel free to do so. I love seeing other people's code and looking at it, and I do learn from it too. It's not just a Ed takes your code and makes fun of it. This is a Ed learns from your code too, which is also very fun. I appreciate this session because it's it's kind of uh, forward looking as opposed to you know parachuting in and checking what's wrong with the server, what crashed, what happened. Instead, you kind of take an approach like uh, what's going on and where will this lead us? What what are we getting into? What are we going to need to manage in a week or two? Um, I think that was very valuable, uh, and that's my takeaway sort of from the session. Thank you. And definitely uh, one, uh, you know, many of us here probably lived and worked in the world of operational stuff where those fires come to you. And if anybody here has ever worked in the world where you're managing servers and instances and databases, and you're the target of those alerts when things break, you know what it feels like to be woken up at two in the morning by a broken thing, whether it's a server or a database or an app, and no one likes that. And so preventing that makes a lot of people's lives easier, even if it's not your own life, the people whose lives you made easier will really appreciate it. They'll appreciate it. They'll buy you pizza or something nice, a drink maybe. And who says no to that? I'm the developer here. I'm usually question. the guy who Edward. buys pizza. <laughs> Edward, we have one question which Tim has asked. Like, I noticed that you are doing uh, this from SQL Server. Do you have anything around Postgres or MySQL? Good question. I have not written code to do all the same things out of those um, databases, but if you use them, many of the same views and functions exist over there. Finding an analogous set of views to work from or tables is not difficult. So I really just say dive onto Google and play a bit, but you'll find very, very quickly the same questions I'm asking here can be answered there. If you Google, how do I get row counts for tables in MySQL uh, without using count star or something like that, you'll find it. Much of this metadata is also stored in those databases and you can get them. So I can't just hand you the code right now, sorry, but you can get and kind of copy the same idea and do the same things if you want to. Thank you. So Salam says, uh, please, can you please share the source code to play with and apply your concepts? Um, is there a GitHub link or something that we can put in chat? <clears throat> um, I don't have one yet. I will post it. I have a Dropbox link. So let me, how about this? We'll just do this live. This is fun. We're all friends here, right? Let's do it live. All right, doing it live. I'm gonna zip, I'm gonna zip files live. Oh my God, this is gonna be crazy. We're gonna take uh, the slides and this. Oh my goodness, I'm creating an archive. This is crazy. Boom. There we go, I created an archive. And now I'm going to create a Dropbox link or crash my computer. One of the two. I... Where is my Dropbox link? That's strange. Well, this is what I get for doing it live, isn't it? This is what I get. This is what I get. There I we go. That's the definition of it. Yeah. It sank. I had to sync. I just created a new file. Is what happens. But anyway, here is a Dropbox link. It should work. If for any reason it doesn't work, let me know, and I will hit my computer a few times and make it work. I promise. But um, I'll put this on Twitter as well later on. And if they, uh, we do all of our testing live. Yeah, I, I love that. There was there was a wonderful, wonderful presentation I did in New York City on Dynamic SQL years ago, where my laptop broke in the middle of the session, it just turned off, went black, didn't turn back on. I was like 20 minutes in, and I had this like five second, it felt like a million years moment, where I'm just sitting there and thinking. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. There's a window right there. I could jump out the window, but then it went on and I thought, you know, what? I'm just going to keep going. I kind of know it's in the slides. I'll just keep going. And it ended up being fine. And in the end of the day, the people in the session kind of actually felt sympathetic as opposed to being like that idiot. How did his laptop die? What a moron. It was more of like a, well, that didn't go so bad. Uh, he didn't jump out the window at least. That's a and great like takeaway. It was a seventh, was a seventh great... floor. So, you know, that wouldn't have been good. It's, it's a great takeaway for anyone who wants to get into public speaking or, or is new to it. Um, the audience wants you to succeed. The audience likes you. That's why they're here, right? So people feel terrible about public speaking or are super nervous about failing and no one cares. It's, it's all good and they're rooting for you to succeed. I highly, highly agree with that. I, I highly recommend speaking in general. If you've ever spoken before or have done it in a very limited mm -hmm. setting, um, take the plunge. It is, it's, 
can be nerve wracking, but it is fun. And that key right there is what makes it tolerable. Understanding that everyone's kind of there for you. Like they want to hear what you have to say. They want to be there for you. As long as you kind of just roll with the punches and have fun, they will too. And unless you're out there being a jerk, they're not going to be jerks back. And that's really how it works. Um, there's always somebody, but you can laugh them off. And that's not a problem. There's always a know-it-all or somebody out there. And we can laugh them off and make jokes. They're fun. <laughs> As long as we stay within the code of conduct, kind of. Correct. <laughs> Correct. We'll yes, but of course. <laughs> I'm not going to violate the code of conduct. We made it 65 minutes and I'm not going to violate it now. Come on. Yeah. Not funny. 72 minutes into the call. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late for that. We're not going to do that. This is good. Well, it's too late to kick you out, so do what you want. <laughs> Wait a second. Wait a second. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it. I do love the point about testing live though, because we actually do a lot of testing live that we don't think about. Like, there was one time that I, I was talking to a developer and they're like, we should really just never test our things live. And I'm like, have you ever considered the possibility that whenever you release code, that release to production kind of is like a live test and you're seeing if it's gonna work. You've tested before in dev environments and they worked and you fixed whatever wouldn't work, but you're now going to production, you're testing it. Isn't that kind of like a test? And you're gonna have your things are gonna go wrong after that. You're gonna have tickets, you're gonna have bug fixes in the future that are the result of this. Isn't it kind of like testing live? And they're like, no. Okay, no problem. <laughs> it was a philosophical question. I was just messing with you. It's just philosophical. I'm making you think a little. I'm, it's fine. I mean, as the old saying goes, everyone has a test environment, right? And and a few people even have dedicated production environments. Hmm. Yep. I, there's still a few, th I, everywhere I've been in my life, there's been things I've done live in production because there was nowhere else to do it. And you do the best you can, try not to break things, but those things do, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so there was, different. It, was a, it was a simpler time. So I think it was maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, we used to do everything in production because testing wasn't really a thing, at least where I worked. And, uh, and then everyone started demanding that we put everything in test and dev environments and stuff like that. And now I like it. Maybe I'm older. I wouldn't go back, but, but back then it felt just ominous and, and cumbersome. I think that when you're like little and you have a small startup and there's not a lot of people, there's kind yeah. of a joy to just like throwing stuff in production, then fixing it and keeping on going like live all the time. It's kind of like a train that's going on the tracks really fast and it's exciting and it works. But I will say that there, even like in analytics environments or, or, or whatnot, it's, it's nice having a place to test and do all that stuff because eventually something will break. You'll think that my ETL can't break anything. I'm just grabbing data. But then <laughs> something happens, right? You, we've all at some point in our careers said, it's going to be fine. It can't break anything. It's just small. It's not a big mm. deal. It's not, and we we'll always regret those words. They come back what and haunt us. What could possibly crash? It will one day, like maybe 99% of the time, you'll be okay. 1% of the time, though, you'll be in that room. Some people are looking at you and it's going to be awkward. You have to explain yourself and you probably can't smile and laugh it off as easily. You can't just tell them you were drunk. There's no easy excuse. And that sucks. And, and <laughs> I'm enjoying some of the stories here, by the way, uh, of this yeah, year. Yeah, these are horror stories. I'm reading actually right now, which is why I'm like going like this, I'm just reading because I'm very interested, like, you know, just <clears throat> adding indexes. Yeah, it's, that's a great example of something that like is so innocuous, but when it's your 40th index, it may not be so innocuous anymore. Always watch out for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I find in many places I've been the production environments are better than dev environments. So you have a production environment with compute, and then you have your dev environments that have compute, and they're very, very different. And so you run something in dev and it takes five seconds and everyone's like oh my god five seconds is forever but then in production it takes a millisecond because you have compute and then eventually <laughs> one day you say can we just get a like dev qa environment what's that gonna cost um money <laughs> sanity is it good enough uh, it's sometimes it takes a long time to get that though i find very few places want the like to like because it costs money it costs time it costs resources and not everybody wants to spend money Though eventually you do, and something big goes wrong and it costs a lot of money, then you can say, hey, this thing that costs a lot of money costs less than that. And that's okay, right? I mean, in my experience, the hardest thing about setting up test environments is that the test data never looks like production data. And, and I think that's a common truth for pretty much every place I've been for the last 20 years. It's always kind of a subset of the data or made up data or because you've, you've, uh, 
anonymized it. It doesn't really look like production data. And so developing in test is still pretty theoretically, just theoretical. It doesn't, you still don't know really what's going to happen when you go to production. One of the best evolutions that happened over time, I thought with dev QA data was that in the olden days, you would just test some production data or copy your production data somewhere and use it. Just use it. Like, hey, I'll just copy it and use it. And then like GDPR came along and privacy and all those compliance agreements and things came along. And suddenly like, oh, I can't have production data anymore. I guess I'll just make up my own data. But then the made up data wasn't really as good. So then you went back and said, all right, now let's take our production data and copy it and then fake it and like remove all the stuff from it and clean it up and make it so that it's okay and we're not violating international law anymore. So now it's like a dance. It's like a game. I'm like, what do I have to do here to test my application and not get arrested? But we'll take. I have to ask that question. God, that's horrible. I don't want to ask that question every day. How do I not go to jail? Or how does like, you know, how do I get brought into a room where someone says, is there a PII in there? And I'm like, there's PII in my underwear now. Like, I don't know what to say. Like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh god i know there's ways to do it you you just apps for it. you can obfuscate it and do all the right things but still it's just one of those things where we think about because there will be times where people will say we need production like data and then it's a little harder how do we get a production like but not too production like so it's like a game yeah. you get it just right and then you're happy but it's <laughs> it's a fun conversation I'm gonna use that joke again, by the way, the PII in my underwear. I'm gonna use it again if you never thought of that. Before. 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10. <laughs> it was, it was. <laughs> gonna use comedy that gold. <laughs> Woo! That's what we're here for, right? Where this is a comedy routine. I mean, we're learning it, things too. This was this was the most demo heavy stand-up set I've ever seen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you really could have like a stand-up session though, very easily at a big conference. You could very easily just have like an hour or half hour comedy session because there is so much material out there. Like we all have those jokes, those things people have done that have led down the rabbit hole of crazy stuff. I mean, somebody at some point is taking your database and like renamed it in your local management studio when you weren't looking to put recovery on the end in parentheses, thinking it'll be funny. So then you came back there and saw the alias for it and said, oh my God, I'm screwed. But then they went in and actually did stuff in production, like started running DBCC commands and stuff in there and freaked out and actually caused latency. And then it was like, oh God, maybe that wasn't a good prank after all. That was a bad prank. That, that sounds a lot like a Rob Volk joke. Yeah. <laughs> There's a question here about uh, DMOS performance counters. What counter value measures seconds, minutes? That actually varies. It is not universal. I would say that check, the, check Microsoft documentation that overlaps with a lot of the counters you'll see in extended events and profiler, uh, but is not the same for every counter. If you can't find it, let me know and I'll find it for you and help you find it. I've worked with a lot of those before. I've used many of those in production environments and dev environments. If you can't find the unit, just throw the counter at me after the call, like tweet me or something and I'll, I'll find it. Um, oh, you stole my joke. You stole my joke. I love the batch separator, changing it from go. Then you can like mess with people. That's so fun. And then it, like, it breaks things. Oh, I like that. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> you can create you can create aliases too. Okay, they're asking for the Dropbox links again. Well, luckily it's still on my clipboard, so um, we'll do that for now. Um, but yeah, you can like alias things in Management Studio. So many of us will alias useful things like hey, like SSF select star from expands beautifully, right? But you can start putting in aliases for things like select or go or if or then or else. And then what happens is people are typing their code and they're like select and then expands into a giant blob of code. Usually it's to be ASCII art, like, you know, I pranked you. Uh, <laughs> be careful, by the way, I did actually prank somebody back. There was one time like about four years ago, five years ago, where somebody pranked me. They went on my machine, they mucked the backgrounds and stuff in management studio. And I got very, very serious. And I said, you do know the employee handbook says that accessing another person's machine without their consent can result in termination, don't you? And I stared at them for like 15 seconds and their face went from like <sighs> to, like horror and I'm like, I gotcha. And that was it. And it was like, suddenly the prank went from like their prank to you just peed yourself, didn't you? Sorry, but you, you earned it. Don't go on my machine. PII'd. <laughs> you PII'd, yeah, there you go. But like, <clears throat> that's real though, because you, you really don't want people going in your machine. It really is a bad idea to go on somebody else's machine unless you really know them. That's a pretty dangerous prank to pull. You know, swapping the keys in the keyboard is pretty comical. 
Uh, somebody may not notice that. <clears throat> Removing a key can be kind of comical, but, but going on the machine is a little risky. I would generally advise against that unless you know the person well enough to know that you won't end up in HR's office the next day getting in trouble or prank them back, but with a very serious face because that's totally worth it. I, and, and to be fair, if you leave your computer unlocked, you're probably going to go to HR too, depending on where you work. So for all of you people going back to the office, remember Windows L to lock your computer. That is very that's, good advice. That very, is great advice. advice. I'm definitely guilty of leaving it open as I leave the room. I'm like, I'll be right back in a second. And then it's like, well, it only takes a second. It really only takes a second. of you know, Like your manager is standing out. behind you or something, or some executive is standing behind you, like just hanging out, waiting for you to return. And they're like, hey, is your machine unlocked? And I'm like, um, that's actually my, my background screensaver thing. That's normal. I just keep <laughs> the management studio open like that. It's, it's just funny. See, here, I'm going to move my mouse. I'm back now. Let's go. Oh, uh, that, that's like, I, next I will think level. I would lie like that. <laughs> I'm going to say I consulted for an American bank here in Sweden and they actually had roaming auditors who would walk around. And if they discovered that you'd left your computer unlocked, you know, without actually sitting at it, there would be consequences. Uh, oh, you yeah, can't there... fire people in Sweden, but there were consequences. I know people contracting with like military and governments where that's the same kind of thing. If you screw that one up, even if there's no harm done, you'll never do it again because somebody's <laughs> going to talk to you. And there's somebody talking to you is not going to be like a manager. It's going to be like somebody way up there who's just going to say, listen, there are people that will put you in rooms for doing this. Don't do this again. And you'll take it seriously. <laughs> there's a rule somewhere. You know, sometimes I'll joke with somebody like, hey, you ever read the employee handbook for a company? It's like 96 pages. How do you know it's 96 pages? I read the whole thing. You read it? I read the terms of service and you and user license agreements too, do you? And I'm bluffing. I don't usually read those things, but sometimes I look at them, I browse them. They're kind of funny sometimes. There's some comical stuff in them, but if I freak somebody out though, just tell me you read it though, because that will just, the whole worldview of you will change because they'll be like, you're the kind of person that would read that? Holy shit. You're, they'll, they'll, it changes everything. Yeah, you, your lawful evil is the is the alignment chart if yep. you read the the entire terms and conditions. Yeah. How he brought us into the D and D world. I love it. I love it. I love it. This is great. We never left. Yeah, we're always there. <laughs> yeah. We're actually, yep. We're doing a little mini campaign at work we're starting, which is super exciting. Uh, that's going to be one of the fun things we're doing. Post group by a little fun post work little D and D one shot campaign. It's going to be pretty fun. We're all That's nerds. Nice. It's perfect. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> lawful, lawful evil just is one of those special alignments because it really mixes very well with the real world because we all know people in the real world who are the perfect lawful evils. Like those, those executives or those people that just run something and the thing they run, they want to win. They don't want to break the law. They don't want to, they don't want to break the rules. They just want to win. And that just makes it always interesting. And they discover, Hey, wait, if I invent the rule, if I change the rules, then I'm not breaking them. And that just goes down the whole road of a different universe of crazy, but hey, I'm sure we've all been switched <laughs> that at some point in our lives somewhere. You've probably seen that maybe. It's kind of fun. I'm, I, I'm more of the, I like the opposite speed, chaotic good. It's like, do I know what I'm doing? No. Do I want to? No. Am I having a good time? Yes. You know, it's just here for a good time, not for a long time. That's <laughs> my and every once in a while, you're going to chaos your way into a win. You're going to do something crazy that no one expected and the DM didn't expect. And somehow you're going to like roll a 20 and it's going to be amazing. You're mm -hmm. like, you're face to face with the opposing army. They're about to slaughter you and you sing a song. But boy, you sang it so well. And somehow you rolled three 20s in a row and now they've joined you. And now you're the commander and now you're singing into battle. And how did that happen? <laughs> wow. That's how I became a horse whisperer one game. It was just a series of 20s. And I was like, this is great. Uh, um, my favorite, I was like, uh, the who horses, buttercup and hydrangea. I was like, assume alpha position. Never met these horses. They knew what it was. They really assumed alpha position. So it worked out. <laughs> this is this conversation is really, really, I don't know anything about D&D. &D, so oh, no. Let me uh, adjust my glasses here. Hang me. on a second. Hang on a second. Okay. <laughs> they just... <laughs> Okay, pocket protector in line. There we go. I don't oh, know. fully in there. Yeah, I'm already wearing my retainer. We're good to go. <laughs> my braces are perfectly aligned. Yeah, we're going oh. great. I love the nerding aligned. out here. This is great. Yeah. So right now, I think about 10% of the people here really appreciate this, and the rest are like, what just happened? 
what just oh. happened? <laughs> <laughs> we are Let's see some thumbs up or in. thumbs down. Yeah. <laughs> and let me tell you, if this is like 5 p.m., you know, if it's like the evening, we're heading into like everyone break for dinner and drinks. This would be a lot crazier right now. Um, but, you know, this is heading back to work for many of us and back into the real world soon. So we can only, uh, we're waiting for the source code. I just, I, did, I gave the link. It's 5.15 p.m. in Stockholm. So I did put the link to the Dropbox in the chat to people who are asking. Um, check that, please. If you can't click on the link for any reason, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I will put it on Twitter as soon as I get off um, the session. But I did post it. Oh, all right, all right. Boy, <laughs> spamming it, aren't you? I didn't do that, by the way. I did not spam it. That was somebody else who did it. It wasn't me. So. That was it terrible. was me, chaotic good. <sighs> he didn't break the rules. He was just very thorough. I get it. I get it. And in the meantime, Dave has joined. Welcome, sir. <laughs> Great. Great. Hello? Oh, hello. How are you? This is where I begin to fade away and somebody begins to fade in. Oh, you're welcome to stick around as long as you want. I have lunch waiting for me, actually. I'm quite hungry, but that's, I'll Ooh. stick around for a bit longer and um, then I'll enjoy my Sojuan food, which is mouth, mouth watering, death spicy. I love spicy. Ooh. So uh, the, nice. the world will be on fire after this, but it'll be a good fun. I have Thank ideas you. for good dinner. For now. Thank Excuse you. Thank you. <clears throat> thanks for an amazing session oh thank you for being here i'll stick around for a bit longer but i'm glad you were able to moderate and be here uh it's wonderful having people helping it makes it so much easier it really does great tip in the future for any future aspiring speakers um always have moderators and people there with you who you know because it really makes your life a lot easier just having an ally or two on your side is nice as opposed to being alone very big difference Jeremy, help me out here. Uh, Andy wants to know if there's a general speaker about that's an email that goes out to attendees, right? What's oh, the yeah, you it is. I was just yeah, I was I was I was <laughs> typing the reply and I was like, ah, <clears throat> I can't unpause and finish typing. But yeah, uh, we will have a, a speaker evaluation section. It's not so much of like evaluation as you know, if he has got something nice to say, say it here, got something constructive to say, uh, you know. Put that there, but uh, stay tuned for our post event survey. We're going to be sending it to everyone. That's going to include just general feedback about the event, some of your favorite sessions, and anything you want to tell us. Feel free to evaluate. I don't mind evaluations at all. Uh, be constructive. And uh, I have not, just for the record, I've had no coffee yet today, just so you know. Uh, I usually have it in the oh, afternoon. Oh, wow. Usually around I like you know, tell. noon or one or so, I'll usually make a pot of coffee, but I wait till later because I'm usually pretty wired in the morning. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. I can't do anything without coffee. I have two younger kids here. I have a three and a five year old. And so they're always very <laughs> energetic. They're bouncing off the walls. And so I do enjoy the ability for at least part of the day to like be pushing them around and being like, hey, why aren't you going faster? You're five. You should be full of energy. <laughs> You're like, you eat 20,000 calories of goldfish every day. Come on, get with it. I got this. <laughs> they're like, dad. I'm like, come on. If I can do it, you can too. I'm old. You're not old. Get going. Get going. You're chill, dad. <laughs> Oh, it really could all just be, it could all be one giant laugh truck on YouTube at this point. It really could. <sighs> is I the think next the, session beginning at 1130, by the way, just so I know. Uh, the next session is in nine minutes. Yes. Okay. And we okay. actually have Dave's in both right. channels. So it doesn't matter which track you join, you, you're going to watch a Dave present. <laughs> well, let great. me, um, let me unshare my screen so the next speaker can get on with it. And, um, I'll probably duck out for a bit and eat and stop, start popping back in later and saying hi. Um, but thank you very much for having me. I, I had a great time. I'm going to hand this over to the next speaker to get coordinated and do their thing. So thank you. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Can I share my screen? You can do that. Or if Dave wants to put up a slide or something. Let's wait for Dave. Yeah. Um, you can share your screen.